Okay, hey guys. So, my my talk. Breach huffing, a culinary exploration of data breaches. Um, sounds a bit silly, but it's good for getting into conferences. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, uh, having a look at data breaches. So, this is me, Frank Allenby. I work at Talspace. I'm a security analyst, and my email address and Twitter handle if you know that interests you at all. Um, so, I'm going to give a foreword here. There is some credit to SensePost where I used to work because much of this research was done there, though I do currently work at Telspace. So just you know, giving a bit of credit to the time that I spent while I was there. Um, the methods here th that I used on my own, they're probably imperfect, so anything you guys might come up with are probably better than what I've done. Just keep that in mind. I use fake data for this talk. There's not much data, but it's fake, it's not real. Uh, I don't have any access to breach data at this point in time. And I won't be able to help you guys get breach data and, uh, you know, source it or anything like that. So please don't ask me. And then, yeah, much love. So, for data breaches, uh, well, a bre basically, a breach is data obtained in an unauthorized manner, and it happens to be sensitive quite a lot of the time since... If it wasn't sensitive, there would be no point in really um, wanting to steal it, right? Uh, okay, so we'll go through, have a look at some of the top ones. So we got Yahoo there at three billion. They started off at a couple billion or a couple hundred million. Turns out it's three billion, actually, their entire record, their entire user base. Then it goes down to Adult Friend Finder, where we get the Telspace Oaks like Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I use you as the dummy of my jokes, and then Court Ventures, Deeper Analytics, two kind of data analysis firms, um, MySpace, eBay, Equifax, which is very fun because it's basically like half of America, so you know half of America is now screwed, and that's one of the three big credit firms. So if you got hacked in that breach and now someone's impersonating you, you put a freeze on your credit account. It's only with these guys. The other two credit firms don't care about what these guys are doing. So even if You've been hacked. You're still hacked in two other places. <laughs> um, and then LinkedIn, which most people use, that's from 2012, so it's a bit old. So the South African one that we had recently here was the Master Deeds breach. Um, you know, hit headlines all over the place. It, hit, it affected about 60 million South Africans in total. That's how many breaches, I mean, how many individual people were affected, individual ID numbers, which is basically like everyone because we there's about 56 million of us here. So it's probably not everyone, but like there's a bunch of dead dudes in there and stuff. <laughs> but you're probably in there. So that's like names, addresses, ID numbers, uh, you know, all that fancy stuff that people like, especially the, 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 the deeds people like where you live, what you've done, the history of your stuff, all of that fun stuff. The original source is murky. Nobody really knows where it comes from. There's a whole lot of you did this and I did that and this guy like saying that and this guy and people's reputations being damaged. So I'm not mentioning anyone. I'm just saying some kind of deeds database sales corporation. That's where it came from. Uh, and it's assumed to be wide, to be widely spread because effectively it was just a thing sitting on a web server somewhere that you could crawl for and download a 30 gigabyte file with South Africa's um, population. So this is effectively how a breach happens, right? The breach happens, so it gets hacked, in whatever way it gets hacked, then it, one of the two things starts to happen. It either gets leaked directly, so someone sends it to someone, someone makes a torrent of the thing, someone releases it online, then any of us can go and download it, or it gets sold, which is usually on the dark web, you know, with, to bit, with Bitcoin or, you know, all of those fancy things that people use to buy drugs and stuff as well. Oh, sorry, whoops. And then usually once it's been sold, more people have it and it gets leaked eventually and then we get to have it too because we're cheap bastards. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep, that's how I get on, well, how I used to get my breaches. So, a breach is forced data liberation. We gotta liberate the data, man. It's trapped in those databases. Got to be free. <laughs> so one way, well, these are ways it can be breached. So system configuration issues like open databases. Some dude happens to leave MySQL port open with no password. You know, here, have my data. That's fun. Um, public files. Someone like the master deeds breach. You just drop a SQL file on a server and hope nobody hits it. But that's not going to happen. Someone's going to find it. 
Unprotected, uh, protected displayed data. So this is when, for example, you'd go to a website, you type in an ID number and it dumps out the details for the dude, right? So what happens if you take your friend's ID number or your other friend's ID number, or if it's one, two, three, four, you can just go from one to the maximum and get everyone. And that's effectively a data breach because you're still stealing the data, it's just not directly from the database. And then internal theft is often the case where some dude doesn't like the company, like Edward Snowden, I guess you could say, is a, one of them. Um, he stole all that stuff that caused, you know, the NSA a much fun time. Um, they might not surface anytime soon. So something might get breached in 2012 and released in 2015-ish, like the LinkedIn breach. Um, so you never really know what has been breached or what hasn't been breached until people actually know about it. So what we know about now is probably like this much of what's actually been breached because people like to keep their data for themselves. And there's no reason for you, for, for companies not to collect all, all of your data. So you sign up to LinkedIn, they collect all of your stuff, but they're collecting periphery stuff as well, metadata, what you visited, when you visited the website, who you talk to, all of this stuff, and they just shove it in databases and databases and databases, and you can imagine this happens for everything. Take a lot does this, they analyze what you want to buy, what you're buying, um, so that they can match it with, you know, maybe your friends or whatever it might be, which means, there is so much data out there to steal and it's easy to collect it, so companies just kind of throw data around like it's, like it's nothing, like it doesn't mean much. And there happens to be this kind of attitude of, oh, we got hacked, shit, like, you know, it happens, but like, the people don't take it seriously, right? They're like, I got hacked and then the American banks or whatever it might be, uh, they just, eat the fine because it's this much money and they don't really give a shit. Um, it's being helped a little bit by like different regulations and stuff, but most of the time, especially for banks, banks kind of weigh up how much it's gonna cost them to fix a thing versus how much it's gonna cost them to pay the fine and most of the time the fine is just So they just happen to choose to get hacked instead. So they don't love you guys very much. <laughs> And also, they got hacked, but we won't get hacked, right? Our stuff is always secure. We never get hacked. Nope, you're gonna get hacked someday and it's gonna hurt like a bitch, or you won't even know about it. And then you're gonna get hacked again because they used the original thing to hack you. So, yeah. Uh, one kind of rule about the internet is don't put anything on there that you don't expect to get hacked because it's probably gonna get hacked. If you want a fun experiment, take like a server, put it on the web and watch the SSH login access, access logs. Within seconds, you're gonna have Oaks from China just hitting that thing with the common credentials. And it's actually, sorry, back to this one point. I've read of reports of dudes that bring servers online and it gets hacked before they can even configure the damn thing to use it for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and what has been breached cannot be unbreached, right? It's out there, it's out there. You can't unsee something like you're there and you're there and I can't unsee you guys, so I can't. <laughs> which is not meant in an offensive way. It was an example. Um, kept it obvious, no, I don't mean it like that. I can see you too, you bastards. <laughs> you know what? We can all see you, so it's all good. Yeah, so you guys are losing then. We're sharing, right? <laughs> it's uh, okay, yeah, so. You cannot take this data back. It's like opening a fire hose, it's gone. You can't get, stuff the water back in the hose unless you're extremely pro at like chopsticks. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we actually give a lot of it away ourselves. We don't even think about this, but the, um, we give our Facebooks and Instagrams and Snappy Chats and Tweety Tweets and all the flippy flaps and blah, 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 all of these things, we just freely spread to the world like, hey look, I'm in Cape Town right here, right now, and then three seconds later you post a thing. So dudes can like watch your Instagrams and then see you're walking down the bloody street in Cape Town because it's amazing and wonderful for you, but everyone else can track you. And if they don't like you very much, then they can say hi and, you know, murder you. Um, but what it means is this is all open, right? So people can passively collect data about you that you're giving them. So if you give them something, then, you know, what do you expect, really? Which is why I don't have social media, but that makes life difficult in other ways. <laughs> so, and you cannot really authenticate with what's public. So if the master de deeds breach is done, you got your first name, last name, and, e and ID number, how can a bank ask you for your ID number you know, to verify that it's you. So how many phone calls do you get from a bank and says, hey, it's Standard Bank, we want to verify this thing, please give me your ID number. Like, sweet bro, but 
like, that guy knows my ID number as well. <laughs> and also, like, a lot of companies, you just phone in and they say, hey, what's your ID number? Like, okay, fucking, this, here's this guy's ID number, I'm him now, kind of thing. So I'm going to go through a little bit of terminology. So, for the people that are not initiated as much. So, database is basically a bunch of stuff that's collected into individual little compartments. The records are the individual things, like you and you and you and you and you are a record in a data breach. And a table is a collection of us. So a table would be the room, and we are all individual people inside the room at this point in time. Uh, SQL, structured query language. SQL, SQL, Squirrel, Squirrel, whatever the hell you want to pronounce it. Uh, so we've got there in the beginning, select whatever, whatever, ID name and surname from users. Users is the room. ID name and surname is an individual attribute of, an, of a record where the ID is lit or whatever you want to, uh, you know, specify. So I could select Charlie from the room and then I would get Charlie. We could have happy fun times later. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of what they tend to look like. A bit of a demo record. This is the fake data I spoke about. You get, you know, the ID, lead, username, Hexar Kitter, name, Harold, surname, O'Neill for SQL injection and other such things. <coughs> Email, bloody blah, blah. Phone number, bloody blah, blah. And password is my hot cousin 69, which exists and has been found in Charlie. undisclosed. <laughs> Char <laughs> okay, I'm going to start picking on Kenny. In Kenny's, uh, you know, one of, one of Kenny's data breach records. <laughs> So what do we want to do, right? We've got all of this cool stuff. There's like, we've got millions and millions of records. As you saw back there, three billion Yahoo records, hundreds of millions of other records. Um, not all of it is out there. We know the scope of the breaches. The Yahoo one, I don't have, I, I don't know where you can get the three billion records, but basically this shit is freaking useful, man. We have billions and billions of records and we want to index it. Why? So we kind of want it to be like this. It's a little quest icon from World of Warcraft if you've played the game. Um, so the quest is to make it look like that kind of. So you can just type in an email address or a domain name like gmail.com or fnb.ca.za or whatever MTN, Telspace, and then get a list of Telspace people and their passwords or their first names or their surnames or their phone numbers or whatever. So why? Well, we have a scenario here, right? We're on assessment as a pen tester for Evil Corp. And we, there's a one website and one API, both with authentication. So you need to log into this bitch somehow. And we don't have any other luck. There's no like open port thing there somewhere that we can just pwn. So now we have this scenario. We're kind of stuck because we don't have creds. We can't pwn the thing in any other way. So what do we do? We kind of end up having to brute force this thing. Now, where do you actually get stuff to use to brute force? Like, how do you know? what Evil Corp emails look like. How do you know who works there? How many, how do you know how many people are that work there? So we can use it for recon, right? To actually find how many people work there. You know, is it 50, is it a big company, is it a small company? Good luck brute forcing small ones because they're actually quite a lot harder than the big ones. <clears throat> and, you know, as part of recon, user discovery. So who works for Evil Corp? We can get a list. Often the South African banks are 50,000 plus users. Um, you can brute that thing, it'll take a while, but you'll probably get someone with something stupid like password123. Often executives as well, by the way. Um, you can find their passwords. So you, you need to know who works, you want to know who works there and what their passwords are. So if you have this website for Evil Corp and you want to try to log in, now you can get Evil Corp and their passwords and then try to log in to the website. Now, we can also use it to construct word lists with the pirate doge. Uh, many passwords, very crack. Wow! <laughs> and we can use it for analysis for stuff like um, how many breached email addresses are there per domain. So we can actually watch, you know, tellspace.co.za breached email addresses. Are there five or ten? It's a small company. Bigger companies, you know, more than that. You can also watch it over time as they get pwned, if that makes sense. Whoopsie. Right click. Um, what are the most common passwords? You know, one, two, three. Oftentimes it's like summer or spring or arsenal or football, like teams and that sort of thing. And I don't know, something kind of interesting to think about is the strength of a hashing algorithm versus the actual organization's security. So if an organization uses bcrypt, 
is it going to be more secure than an organization that uses MD5 to hash their passwords, or is there no correlation there? I mean, that's a pretty interesting thing to kind of have a look at. In my experience, uh, yeah, that kind of happens to be the case. LinkedIn used SHA-1, plain old SHA-1 without any salt, so you can basically just run through that thing with a word list and crack a shitload of them. Um, I think there's about 99% of them cracked at this point in time, so if you have a LinkedIn account uh, and you haven't touched it, you to change your password. So these are real email, email addresses. So we have real data breached from real databases, real people, real email addresses. We know they exist, we know they're in use, and oftentimes someone has gone there and clicked that verify this email address button <laughs> with their, you, their real passwords, because someone has to type the password in, so we know they're being used by these people. They're not just random bullshit. I mean, there are gonna be random bullshit people that just type shit in and press enter to get into the website because they don't feel like having to, I don't know, sacrifice their child to the demogods. Um, real people as well. So these are real people, real, you know, addresses, phone numbers, email, whatever, ID numbers. So this stuff is actually useful because we know it's realistic. It's not some fake thing. It's not a model. It's not a guess. It's not an anything. It's real. So my first try at getting that thing working was to have a Python front end. We're using the Flask micro framework and Postgres on the, the back end as the database. It was just these two things talking to each other on a very, very, very constrained hardware machine with like a hundred million other things doing stuff on there. So it was kind of a pain in the ass, but it worked. And I don't have screenshots of the thing because it's not my IP, it sends post IP. So I cannot really show you the stuff, but that's just what it was. If it makes sense to you, then cool. So did it work? Well, I learned a few things, and one of them is that breach schemas can differ wildly. So in one schema, you might just have an email address and a username. In the next one, you might have a username, email address, password, first name, and then the next one, you might not even have email address or the password. You might only have personal details, like first names, last names, all that sort of thing. So the stuff is all over the place, and every single breach is different, right? Not, not you, you would store my data differently to the way you would store it and him and him and him. And trying to normalize that in the Postgres database kind of made my life a bit of a bit difficult because you have to squash it all into the same, to the same model. Um, another thing I learned is that breach files are broken. Like when a hacker is sitting in some corporate network hacking a thing, they're not gonna be there like, yeah, I want the file to look nice. No, they're gonna be like, I wanna get the shit out and leave. Like, they don't care. <laughs> So that makes my life difficult because I've now got to go through like tens of gigabytes of shit where there's a, where it's a comma separated thing without quotes, but there are commas in passwords as well. So now you have like some lines with 10, 10 columns and some lines with three and some, you know, it, it makes your life a pain in the ass. So you have to actually write like custom, custom parsers, which I had to do. And I mean, it's fun actually to, to get, to dig into the stuff up until a point at which you kind of realize that it's really getting really tedious because there are hundreds and hundreds of breaches that you need to get through and some of them are not even worth the effort if you think about it. Um, manual, manual management of these things is a pain in the ass because, well, but, nice word. <laughs> um, uh, you've got to actually manage the stuff actively and manually. You've got to make sure that you've curated the data breaches, that the, the data breaches are where you think they came from, and you've got to see what's in every single one. You can't just shove a hundred of them into one folder and click a button and have them all go. Well, you can if you really spend like lots and lots of time writing really highly specialized custom tools to do this for you, which will take a lot of time. And time isn't something that I typically have when I'm building one of these because I really need to get data and I don't really want to spend weeks building a massive tool around it. Um, tools exist for that though, like Kibana and whatnot. I did try them, they didn't really suit my needs. And lots of data means lots of labor. So if I have a hundred breaches, it means I've got to go through a hundred files. And sometimes because the files are broken, it's a hundred times looking through them, writing scripts, making sure they actually pass the data correctly. If it doesn't pass, then I've got to go back and I'll try to do that a hundred times for maybe an hour or three or half a day each. And it's not a hundred, there are hundreds and but I had about 500 individual breaches and that's not even close to what's really out there. So it was about 150 gigabytes once I had indexed everything. And I think, I'm not sure if this is compressed or not, but yeah, which is about 2.3 individual billion, uh, 2.3 billion records that I had indexed to be searched. 
50,000 songs worth ish at three megabytes per song, 100 HD movies worth. <laughs> wink, wink, Kenny. <laughs> what kind of movies are you watching, man? <laughs> so, <laughs> what do we actually want? So, we actually want with this solution to be able to query differing schemas. We want to be able to query differing look kinds of data that look different at the same time without having to finagle stuff too much. So I want to be able to get from one breach and a different breach at the same time without, you know, too much work. We want it to be easy to import the data because it doesn't make sense if it's difficult to import data but easy to query it if it's so hard to get it in that it just takes too long to get it in to, to, to make any sense. <laughs> um, we want a familiar query interface like SQL, which happens to be the most widely used kind of query language slash interface slash whatever you want to call it out there. We want it to be flexible enough to do something now and then when the requirements change in the future, do something else. We want it to be scalable as well. So. Right now it might just be me using it, which is fine when I'm running it myself, but add 10 people onto the thing at once and we'll see how that performs. It doesn't perform very well, at least it did not with the Postgres solution I had, which is not to blame Postgres. It's a combination of Postgres and the hardware and, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. And we want it to be managed because we don't want this to be our problem. It's nicer when it's someone else's problem. We don't have to worry about you know, micromanaging individual pieces of software to make sure that it's using the correct number of processes and memory per process and and all of that in, uh, sort of stuff. And I guess lastly, we want it to be cheap because cheap is nice and it means that we get more budget to do more interesting stuff. So, some possible solutions that I researched were key value relational database structures where y you would use Postgres or a traditional idea uh, rela yeah. relational database, but you'd have like multiple columns that join together with inner joins and all sorts of stuff like that. But that seems like a great idea until you start implementing it and realizing that you're gonna have to start inner joining across millions and millions of records. So for 10, it's quick, it's like instant, but for a million, it takes a really, really long time and then you have to start spending time optimizing your database and that really gets kind of annoying, especially when your hardware is constrained. We can maybe use something like NoSQL, which inv includes stuff like MongoDB, uh, Amazon Dyna bleh, DynamoDB, which is similar to Mongo. You basically take a thing and you shove it in a hole and you say, that's my thing and it's all good. And then later on, um, when you come back, I, so I don't like them very much, by the way. NoSQL stuff I really don't like because it's, it's such a great idea now, but then you come back in a year and I've taken Quibus and shoved him into a thing, but now Quibus is different. And I've taken Kenny and shoved him into a thing. And I'll have all of these different things, but our, cha <coughs> our requirements have changed a year later. And now I need to go back into this NoSQL database and try to mangle through this blob of stuff that I have. Um, I'm not sure if anyone of you has experienced that before, but if you work with legacy systems using MongoDB when it kind of first came out, you'll, you'll have some fun. A key value data store like something like Redis in memory database where you just shove first name, last name, blah, 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 and then values next to each other and kind of just query from that. <laughs> so what I kind of settled on was Google BigQuery. Um, why? Well, it, it, okay, Google's BigQuery is basically Google's serverless, highly scalable, low-cost enterprise data warehousing thing. Lots of big buzzwords in there. It basically means it can store a shitload of stuff very easily and, you know, very quickly. You don't have to worry too much about it. And, whoopsie, the nice thing about Google is that it's, well, okay, sorry, I think I skipped ahead a bit, but it ticks the biggest boxes that I had at least for, for a database management sort of thing, in that it's managed and Google knows what they're doing, right? Google does big data. Basically, Google's business is big data. They collect everything they can about you so that they can sell it to advertisers. It's not valuable to them if they only know your name, when they can know your name, who you visit, who you talk to, blah, blah, blah. I mean, your Android devices feed into the Google machine. Basically, everything you do feeds into Google, and that's ridiculous amounts of data. It's like petabytes upon petabytes that they can query like this. And so I kind of trust them to know what to do with data when I'm storing it with them. BigQuery supports SQL, which is nice because I don't need to change tooling, I don't need to learn new methods, I don't need to do anything strange. You can query different schemas. Um, 
schemas being different models of data, different, so you can say select ID name surname from breaches dot star. <coughs> so it'll get all of the breaches and get those fields from all of the ones where it matches. So you don't have to, you know, faff about with a single column, I mean a single table in a, in a Postgres database or whatever it might be, or MySQL or whatever you choose, you can just add a new table. If it has those fields in there, it will just pull the data out for you and you won't have to worry too much. And it's pretty cheap, right? You get the free tier they have, you get one terabyte of queries per month, which is actually not much when you have a lot of data, but it's quite a lot when you don't, and it's also quite a lot when you manage to optimize your database, or the way you store it. So it's only cheap if you use it properly. And it integrates deeply with the other Google Cloud offerings and stuff like that. So because it's with Google, it's all on the same network, it's all managed by Google, they know what's going on, the teams can talk to each other, the, the software talks to each other, and you don't have any kind of big problems in dealing with multi-cloud multi stuff or managing your own boxes or will this thing support that thing if it's this version. So what does it mean if it's actually used properly? All right, so you get charged by the amount of data processed, which means they, when you do a search, they churn through the data to find what you want, which means they grab everything in a big bag and then they shove their hand in there and find what they want and shove it and, you know, give it to you. Which means that the more data that you ask for, which means if you query more tables or more columns, then you're going to increase the cost. Which means to optimize co for cost, you're going to want to query less tables and less columns because that means less data proce processed. And it can be very expensive very quickly because if you don't do this properly. So don't query everything at once unless you don't like eating because really you can run up bills pretty quick. <laughs> Where I was, it was about, you get a terabyte free, but each query ended up being about 150 gigabytes worth of processed data, which it's a lot. So it's like 10 queries. And then it's $5 per terabyte after the first terabyte. So I think one month it was about $200 or so which is, it's not much for a big company, but it's enough to kind of make you be like, well, th shit, that happened. Um, <laughs> so to optimize for using BigQuery, right, um, I learned that you should split and you should shard your tables. Like, so BigQuery only supports date sharding, which means it will take records that were inserted in specific days and then in the background archive them in different ways so that you can query per day and not the entire data set at once. But you want to split it by breaches and domain. So you can, so for the LinkedIn breach, you'd split it by LinkedIn and then gmail.com or yahoo.com or telspace.co.za or whatever it might be. So yeah, for that, you'd also need more specific queries, but that works well with the search model we have because if we only want telspace, we can just say star dash telspace.co.za and we get only for telspace, which is a total of as many breaches as we have. So if we have 100 breaches, that's 100 tables, which sounds like a lot, but it's not really because each table is going to be very small. So it won't be gigabytes, it might be 50 megabytes worth of trolled data. So Google Cloud Platform, all the things, because it's all under the same roof and it makes sense, right? It's all in the same network. The Google data centers are all connected by these massive multi-gigabit links. The transfer speeds between them are extremely fast and you know, the engineers working on this stuff are very familiar with what happens between the, between, you know, the teams and between the tools. Plus, the data transmitted between data centers is encrypted by default. So anything sent from one data center to another data center is encrypted, which means that the NSA cannot really look at your stuff unless they happen to ask Google very nicely or something like that. So I settled, okay, this is going to sound a bit like a, you know, a Google fanboy rant. I'm not advertising Google. I just chose this because it happens to be really good for the specific solution. I don't work for Google and I'm not, you know, promoting them or anything like that. Um, I ended up using Firebase, which is a mobile and web development platform. It sounds more fancy than it really is, but, well, that's actually pretty cool. But I use it as a content delivery yeah. delivery network which means that I used it to host um, static files. So I just took my HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, dumped it on a server, and let it spread it throughout the world. I didn't have to care about hosting a server in Europe if there's mostly European customers. The shit was everywhere. I didn't have to care. 
um, Google Cloud Functions I also used, which is basically uh, AWS Lambda, if you've ever used it. It's these tiny little snippets of code that you run in the cloud. So on-demand serverless, serverless code spin up and execution, which means that when something happens, it will spin up a new instance of your code, do whatever it needs to do, and then kill itself. So it's, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, I used this to implement the API functionality, which meant that it, every query spawned a new function, which queried the database and then went back to the user. I'll show that in a, data, in a diagram later. I used Google Data Store as a NoSQL document database sort of thing for managing user accounts. Just a little silly thing to bunch, dump a bunch of data in so that people could actually log in and use the thing. And then finally, I used BigQuery, which we've already kind of gone through, to store the actual data. So this is kind of how it looked. So you'd have three users coming in, they'd hit Firebase, which would hit the local, the local instance or the local server, which might be in South Africa, it would give them, you know, the HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. And then that would talk to uh, Google Cloud Functions. So every time a user did a search, it would start a new function. So now we've got three users doing three searches with three individual functions started. So they've got their own individual containerized code running. It's not shared code, or the code is not being shared per user in these individual functions. Each user has their own instance, which means that if I have 100,000 users or one user, it's gonna be using the same amount of time because user one is going to have his own thing, which means it scales extremely well. Um, it matches basically one to one, and the the, the the performance is pretty consistent. You don't, it doesn't matter too much how many people you have because you'll have about the same response time for anything. Because it also, you know, well, it talks to data store at the top there to authenticate, and then it comes down to BigQuery, does the fancy querying stuff, and BigQuery is built in it for, you know, for its own um, scaling and whatnot. So it can handle extreme amounts of load. And because it's on the same network, it means that, you know, the talking be between the functions and the database are extremely, is extremely fast. And once all that's done, the function kind of just grabs the data and sends it back to the user, and then my JavaScript and that stuff would, would, would show it to the dude, or the, or the female, or the whatever. So the wins is that it's Google. So Google kind of knows what they're doing, right? They're pretty well versed in in big data and that sort of thing. It's managed, so I don't have to really give a shit about what happens, it just happens and it's not my problem. <laughs> it's serverless, so nowhere in this process do I have a server running of my own. I don't have a virtual machine, I have nothing to patch, nothing to worry about, I don't care about firewalls, I don't care about any other stuff, Google does it all for me. It's Google's problem and it's all part of the whole pricing structure. So I don't have to care if I've patched my thing properly. I don't have to care if I left an SSH port open or if I left password um, authentication on or whatever it might have been. That's Google's problem. Uh, it's scalable, as I demonstrated. Doesn't matter how many users you have, the, um, the performance is consistent. And it's pretty simple. Like, it looks complicated, but when you get down to it, it's basically calling a thing and then it returns the data. It's not, it's not very complicated. And less moving parts means less maintenance. If something goes wrong, you know, it's either there or there. You don't have to go through a massive tree of stuff and debugging and all sorts of fancy stuff because it's all just there. Um, it is also maintainable, you know, as part of the simplicity argument. Um, you know, it's easy to maintain if you know what's going on because there are so few moving parts. And then I guess it's transparent because you only have one interface that you can look at. So you can see exactly what's there and how it's working and how it's being used. You've got analytics built in with the whole Google Cloud thing so you can see how much is being queried, by who, you know, when, and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but there are also losses to this um, solution and one of them is also that it's Google. So have you ever tried to like contact Google support for anything that's not trivial? Like you get hit with automated system upon automated system upon automated system and if you want human support you've got to pay like stupid amounts of money. And it's not really worth it for most of the time, for most of the stuff, but luckily it's automated enough that you can kind of get by. But still, it's, it's really a pain in the butt. Um, you lose direct control of the servers as well, so you cannot really optimize your stuff, but it's not your problem either, so you know, but if something goes wrong, you're sitting there and you're staring at a screen that Google presents you and you've got no means of support. So 
you're kind of having to sit there and wait for Google to fix this thing for you. Meanwhile, your users are screaming and shouting and you're shouting at you. But, you know, Google's pretty good at keeping their stuff online, probably better than I would be. So, you know. So did this actually work? Um, well, whoopsie, sorry. Did it work? So I'll talk about, yeah, it, it pretty much worked as well as it could have. Um, it did what we needed, needed to do. There was the typical kind of Google interface where you could type in a, a telspace.ca.za and it would give you five or ten people's names and their passwords. And if you wanted more, you could go query for individual records and it would give you everything for that. Um, so it worked pretty much as I wanted it to be to, to work. It worked for everyone that wanted to use it. I didn't have any complaints around it. And people only had compliments for compliments for the thing. So I consider it a win, but I did not optimize it properly because I only had individual breaches as tables rather than sharding it per individual domain to make it cheaper. But other than that, it worked pretty well. And it was effectively free because the one terabyte thing, it gets you pretty far. The one terabyte query from BigQuery, you get two million function executions from the cloud functions, so that's two million individual queries from users. If you have ten users, you're, you're going to struggle to hit that, and you're, you're really hacking a lot of stuff. Um, the data store, you know, it's basically free if you run it properly. Um, I was just thinking of the future. I would, the blockchain kind of seems like an interesting solution because they tend to be distributed. And imagine you were to take the records and shove them into a blockchain. Now they're immutable and accessible by everyone, which means that, you know, you can, this data is there for good. It doesn't matter what's happened to it or where it's gone. Um, so that's a thought for the future. I haven't even tried to investigate that because blockchains are another hole in, on their own. You kind of got to, you end up running down these rabbit holes and you only have so much time. Um, so what happens if you've been pwned or have you been pwned? So, you know, just head over to Troy Hunt's have I been pwned .com to check. It's pretty well known. It'll basically tell you where you've been pwned, if you have been pwned, if an account of yours has been hacked or not. Um, obviously, not everything that's ever been hacked is in there, so just keep that in mind, but it's a pretty good indication. Um, well, what do you do if you've been, you know, hacked, if you find something there? Firstly, you've got to change your passwords because you know, if someone has your password, you've got to change it to stop them from using your password. And you've got to do it now, you know, otherwise it, someone can still use it. And yeah, really, like now. <laughs> and I know it's a pain in the ass. And good luck, good luck if you have the one password to rule them all. <laughs> and in the darkness, bind them. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to help with this, use a password manager, because these things store the passwords for you. You remember one password. Pardon me, but you got to make that thing strong. Um, they have these super passwords that use, is used in, to encrypt all of your other passwords. So pick like a 20 word phrase from your favorite book or your favorite song, or, you know, we all live in a yellow submarine, whatever. <laughs> That's a pretty good one. Include spaces and apostrophes and all that stuff. Good luck brute forcing that. You're not going to get it, dude. Um, so use a password manager. Make the password strong and unique. So it doesn't help if they're strong. You can have the strongest password in the world, but if someone gets that one password, you're still hacked everywhere because it's, it's you know, it's just one password. So you've also got to be wary, and uh, like look out for spam. So now your email address or whatever is available to the world, which means you're going to be getting more spam emails from dudes that actually have your email account or your email address. And fishers are going to go for you, like a lot. Like, I've been hacked a bunch of times. Well, not me, but companies with my information have been hacked. And you get this shit like five times a day. Just people from like Nigeria wanting to sell you like their brides and stuff like that. Like, it gets a bit retarded. Um, so you just got to watch out for that. Some of them are sneaky as hell too. It's like fnb.c.za looks legit, but it's actually like frbg or some shit like that. So. You know, just be vigilant of suspicious activity as well. So if you see login attempts from China, then it's probably not you unless you're visiting China. Like, <laughs> um, so if you see anything like that, then, you know, change your shit. Um, also try to lock down your accounts as much as possible. I don't know what depends on the service, but yeah. And if you've not been pwned, then you're really a lucky bastard because, you know, we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> Eventually, you're probably going to get hacked. Um, yeah, I actually have 15 minutes left. 
but uh, I have some thoughts to, uh, there, uh, sorry? Yeah, is it, is it, call it to half pause, I'm done. 45. Yeah, Just on, right, right on time. Exactly. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Are there any any questions, perhaps, if there is time for questions? Just going to take one, I want to see the next guy. How, okay. uh, how long uh, was that uh, breach um, or exposed with that list of A16 clients on the net? It's, yeah. it's out there now, so it's... Okay, yes. yeah, now permanent. It's, it's, it's yeah, once, yeah, you can't, un, it can't be unbreached, so... <laughs> I can't help you with that. <laughs> it's out there. You should assume that it's been compromised. It was. It was exposed for at least at least seven months. It was exposed before they took it down. Um, it's long enough to assume that basically anyone that's interested has it. So I don't. I can't help you. Yeah, maybe, but I can't help you get it. I just, I don't, yeah, as part of the four word I said, so, um, yeah, you can maybe look on, in the in the dark corners of the internet to see if you can find it, but that's as much as I can help you with that. Uh, anyone else? Um, how oh. complicated do you think it would have been to charge uh, those records that you were speaking? Oh, if you, if you build the infrastructure, the, the, the infrastructure up front, it's not too bad because you, You'd have a script, I guess, that would just break them out by by the domain name, and that would be pretty quick and easy. Yeah, you don't think it would be too difficult, because like, like you mentioned, some of these breaches are like broken. Yeah, the, the, when they're broken, you need to write the manual parsers and then parse them into a, into a way that's consistent. Um, it wouldn't be too difficult. It would have taken probably a week's worth of work to to redo everything to get it fancy, but it's not too bad. It's a, it's basically a little Python script that uh, changes the name of the table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Just so when you were saying like it's a lot of labor putting this stuff into the database, would you be able to like create a script that will identify all this data as an email address and this is the name, this is the last name? There so are there are ways to do that. Um, some more reliable than others. Regular expressions are pretty well used for email addresses and such. Um, names and first names are harder to guess because you know it can be basically any random string that you could think of. How do you know that? I met a guy whose name was Lovemore yesterday. You know, I wouldn't have put that in a database um, of names that I that I had thought would exist. So, you know, it's, it's complicated to. It's complicated. It depends on the situation. But email addresses are easier than others. Yeah, if that makes sense. Okay. Thanks, guys. Cool.